Hello, my name is Erin and I am the president of the Junior League of Norfolk, Virginia Beach. And this week we're launching a new initiative called Book It to Bedtime. We will be celebrating literacy by reading aloud children's books to those here in Hampton Roads. This week, the board of directors and the executive management team will be highlighting one of our favorites, Matilda by Ronald Dahl. Please welcome and enjoy. The Reader of Books. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers, even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration that they manage to convince themselves that their child has qualities of a genius. Well, there's nothing very wrong with all of this. It's the way of the world. It's the only, it's only when parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting, bring us a basin, we're going to be sick. There's the first page. School teachers suffer a good deal from having to listen to all sorts of this twaddle from proud parents but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write down the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorchers for the children of doting parents. Your son, Maximilian, I would write is total washout. I hope you have family business so you can push him into when he leaves school because he sure heck of a won't get a job anywhere else. Or if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write, it's a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the size of their abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by the way she learned this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into natural history and say, the paradoxical cicada spend six years as a grub underground and no more than six days a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son Williford has spent six years as a grub in this school and they are, we are still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona, has the same glacial beauty as an iceberg. But unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might even enjoy writing end of term reports for the stinkers in my class, but enough of that. We have to get on. Occasionally, one comes across parents who take the opposite line, who show no interest at all in their little children. And those, of course, far worse than the doting parents. Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were two such parents. They had a son called Michael and a daughter named Matilda. The parents looked upon Matilda in particularly as nothing more than a scab. A scab is one thing you have to put up with until a time comes when you can pick it off and flick it away. Mr. and Mr. Woodworm looked forward enormously to the time that they could pick up their little daughter off or could pick their little daughter off and flick her away, preferably into the next county or even further than that. It's bad enough when parents treat ordinary children as though they were scabs or bunions, but it becomes somehow a lot worse than the child in question is extraordinary. And by that, I mean sensitive and brilliant. Matilda was both of those things, but above all, she was brilliant. Her mind was so nimble and she was so quick to learn that her ability should have been obvious even to the most half-witted parents. But Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood were both so gormless or so wrapped 
up in their own silly little lives that they failed to notice anything unusual about their daughter. To tell you the truth, I doubt they would have noticed had she crawled into the house with a broken leg. Matilda's brother Michael was perfectly normal little boy, but his sister, as I said, was something to make your eyes pop. But by the age of one and a half, her speech was perfect, and she knew as many words as most grown-ups. The parents, instead of applauding her, called her a nosy little chatterbox and told her sharply that small girls should be seen and not heard. But by the time she was three, Matilda had taught herself to read by studying newspapers and magazines that lay around the house. At the age of four, she could read fast and well, and she naturally began hankering after books. The only book in the world of this enlightened household was something called Easy Cooking, belonging to her mother, and when she had read this from cover to cover and had learned all the recipes by heart, she decided she wanted something more interesting. That's her reading right here. Daddy, she said, do you think you could buy me a book? A book, he said. What do you want a flaming book for? To read, Daddy. What's wrong with the telly? Or for heaven's sakes, we've got a lovely telly with 12 inch screen and now you come asking for a book? You're getting spoiled, my little girl. Nearly every weekend after Matilda was left alone in the house, her brother, five years older than her, went to school. Her father went to work and her mother went out playing bingo in town eight miles away. Mrs. Woodworm was hooked on bingo and played it five afternoons a week. On the afternoon of the day when her father had refused to buy her a book, Matilda set out all by herself to walk to the public library in the village. When she arrived, she introduced herself to the librarian, Mrs. Phillips. Excuse me, Miss Phelps. She asked if she might sit a while and read a book. Miss Phelps, slightly taken back at the arrival of such a tiny little girl, unaccompanied by her parents. Nevertheless, she told she was very welcomed. Where are the children's books, please? Matilda asked. They're over there on the lower shelves. Mrs. Phelps told her, would you like me to help you find a nice one with lots of pictures? No, no thank you, Matilda said. I'm sure I can manage. From then on, every afternoon, as soon as her mother left for bingo, Matilda would toddle down to the library. The walk took about 10 minutes, and this allowed her two glorious hours, sitting quietly by herself in a cozy corner, devouring one book after another. When she read every single children's book in the place, she started wandering around in search of something. Mrs. Phelps, who had been watching her with fascination for the past few weeks, got up from her desk and went over. Can I help you, Matilda? She asked. I'm wondering what to read next, said Matilda. I've finished all the children's books. You mean you've looked at all the pictures? Yes, but I've read the books as well. Mrs. Phelps looked down at Matilda from her great height and Matilda looked back up at her. I thought you were some very poor, Matilda said, but others were lovely. I liked the secret garden best of all. It was full of mystery. Mystery of the room behind the closed door and the mystery of the garden behind the big wall. Mrs. Felt was stunned. Exactly how old are you, Matilda? I'm four years and three months, Matilda said. Mrs. Phelps was more stunned than ever, but she had the sense not to show it. 
What sort of book would you like to read next? She asked. Matilda said, I would like to read a good one that grown-ups read. A famous one. I don't know any names. Mrs. Phelps looked along the shelves, taking her time. She didn't quite know what to bring out. How, she asked herself, does one choose a famous grown-up book for a four-year-old? Her first thought was to pick up a young teenager's romance book, the kind that is written for a 15-year-old girl in school, but for some reason she found herself instinctively walking past that particular shelf. Try this, she said at last. It's a very famous and very good. If it's too long for you, just let me know and I'll find something shorter and a little bit easier. Great Expectations, Matilda read, by Charles Dickens. I'd love to try it. I must be mad, Miss Phelps told herself, but to Matilda she said, of course, you may try it. Over the next few afternoons, Mrs. Phelps could hardly take her eyes off the small girl sitting for an hour after hour in the big armchair at the far end of the room with the book on her lap. It was necessary to re rest the book on her lap because it was so heavy and she couldn't hold it up, which meant she had to sit leaning forward in order to read. Here's the picture of Miss Phelps. You can see Miss Phelps and little Matilda and all the books on the shelf. And a strange sight it was, this tiny, dark-haired person sitting there with her feet nowhere touching the floor, totally absorbed in the wonderful adventures of Pip and old Miss Hashman. And she cobwebbed the house, and by the spell of the magic that Dickens, the great storyteller, had woven in his words. The only movement from the reader was the fifting of the hand every now and then to turn the page. And Miss Phelps always felt sad when the time came for her to cross the floor and say, it's 10 to five, Matilda, time to go home. During the first week of Matilda's visits, Mrs. Phelps had to say to her, does your mother walk you down here every day and take you home? No. My mom goes to Ellsbury every afternoon to play bingo, Matilda said. She doesn't know I come here. But that's surely not right, said Miss Phelps. I think you'd better ask her. I'd rather not, Matilda said. She doesn't encourage reading books, nor does my father. But what do they expect you to do every afternoon in an empty house? Uh, just mooch around and watch the telly. I see, said Miss Phelps. She doesn't really care what I do, Matilda said a little sadly. And Miss Phelps was concerned about the child's safety on the walk through the fairly busy village of High Street and then crossing the road, but she decided not to interfere. And within a week, Matilda had finished Great Expectations, which in that edition contained 411 pages. I loved it, she said to Miss Phelps. As Mrs. Dickens written, has Mr. Dickens written any others? Oh, a great number, said the astonished Miss Phelps. Shall I choose you another? There's little Matilda sitting in the big chair. Look how tiny her feet are. She can't even touch the ground. Over the next six months, Mrs. Phelps, watchfully and compassionate eye, Matilda read the following books. Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bontant, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, Tess of, sometimes when you read, you don't know all the words, and that's okay. You got to sound them out by Thomas Hardy, Gone to Earth by Mary Webb, Kim by Rudy Kipling, The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells, 
The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway, The Sound and the Fur Fury by William Faulkner, The Grape Serath by John Steinbeck, The Good Compassions by J.B. Priestley, Brighton Rock of Graham Greene, and Animal Farm by George Orwell. It was a formidable list, and by now, Miss Phelps was filled with wonder and excitement. But it was probably a good thing that she did not allow herself to completely get carried away by it all. Almost everyone witnessing the achievements of this small child would have been tempted to make a great fuss and shout the news all over the village and beyond. But not so to Miss Phelps. She was someone who men minded her own business and had it long discovered it was seldom worthwhile to interfere with other people's children. Mrs. Hemingway says a lot of, Mr. Hemingway says a lot of things. I don't understand, Matilda said, especially about men and women, but I love them all the same. The way he tells it, I feel I am right there on the spot watching it all. Oh, a fine writer will always make you feel like that, Miss Phelps said. And don't worry about the bits you can't understand. Sit back and allow the words to wash around you just like music. I will, I will, said Matilda. Did you know, Miss Phelps said, that book public libraries like this allow you to borrow books and take them home? Oh, I did not, said Matilda. Could I do that? Of course, Miss Phelps said. When you have chosen the book you want, bring it to me so I can take a note of it, and it's yours for two whole weeks. You can take more than you wish. So here's the picture. See, Miss, Miss Phelps is talking to little Matilda here. From then on, Matilda would visit the library only once a week in order to take out new books and return the old ones. Her own small bedroom now became her reading room, and there she would sit and read most afternoons, often with a mug of hot chocolate beside her. She was not quite tall enough to reach things out around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse which she brought in and stood on it in order to get whatever she wanted. Mostly it was hot chocolate she made, warming the milk in a saucepan, and on the stove before mixing it. Occasionally she made Beauvoir or Ovaltine. It was pleasant to take a hot drink to her room. Hi, Cecilia, come here. All right, come sit down, guys. Hi, okay, let's finish the story. She was not quite tall enough to reach the things around the kitchen, but she kept a small box in the outhouse where she brought in and stood in order to get whatever she wanted, mostly it was hot chocolate. Warming the milk in a saucepan and on the stove before mixing it, it was pleasant to take a hot drink up to her room and have it beside her as she sat in her silent room reading the empty house in the afternoons. The books transported her into new worlds and into, induced her to amazing people who lived exciting lives. She went on an olden day sailing trip with Joseph Conyard and she went to Africa with Ernest Hemingway in India with Rudyard Kipling. And she traveled all over the world while sitting in her own little room in her English village. There's little Matilda right here. Matilda. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys and girls. Chapter two. We'll read that tomorrow.